So you guys know I love Dr. Kirkonda, and we have done a bit of a collab before. Pretty exciting stuff. He's a wonderful content creator, and I really like him. And Dr. K, it's interesting to see how they complement each other. They're so different. I was telling my partner the other day, Dr. K has a boy audience, and Dr. Kirkonda has a girl audience. And it was cool to see Dr. Kirkonda review Dr. K's video. But in this video today, he's actually reviewing, reviewing a TikTok on gaslighting. It's a very short video, but I thought we would watch it together because... What I think is interesting is having a professional review it and then the kind and compassionate kind of professional that I think Dr. Kirkonda is, you know, I'm not the biggest fan of all the TikTok therapists out there, like the real ones, you know, licensed therapists. Some of them I feel are obviously projecting a lot of their own hurt, Dr. Romani. But with that said, I think the two most compassionate people that I've seen thus far that I've really enjoyed and that stand out to me is Dr. Kirkonda and Dr. K. Personally, I just think they're very different, but yet so complimentary. So let's watch this video on gaslighting. I pre-watched a heads up because I didn't realize it was going to be so good. But as I was watching it, I was like, oh, I want to talk to stream about this. I just feel like we're going to have a good combo. So let's go ahead and get started. Hey, deserve listeners. I thought I would watch some TikToks related to gaslighting. I would just type in the word gaslighting into the search bar and see what comes up. And then I'm going to react to these videos. My name is Dr. Kirk Honda. I'm a therapist and a professor. I've become somewhat of a specialist in gaslighting, not only because I've treated convicted perpetrators over the years, but also I get a lot of emails about the concept. So I have had to refine my understanding of it so that I can teach it and talk about it. Let's watch. Here are three examples of what gaslighting looks like. So gaslighting is a psychological manipulation where one person is trying to- Now, I'm not sure if the person on this TikTok is a therapist or anything. I don't know who this human is. So they could just be like a regular person. It says Sabrina Zonar, three examples of gaslighting. And I don't, I don't think this is a medical professional. So I'm not sure sow seeds of doubt into their partner. And they're trying to make them question their own memory, their perception, or their sanity. All right, so doing great so far. She's getting at three examples, but the definition thus far is good. It sounds like she's reading it to some extent from the internet, but yeah, that, that's the definition. But the problem is, is that just reading a definition of a psychological concept is not an indication that someone understands the concept. You know, like I can read the definition of a cancer cell, for example, but I'm not a biologist, I'm not a physician. So I don't know how to diagnose cancer just from reading the definition, but let's watch. Oftentimes this is seen in narcissistic relationships or with narcissists because this is how they gain control in the relationship. So <laughs> the obsession the internet has with narcissism. It's really strange to me as a clinician for almost 30 years and someone who specializes in personality disorders, particularly borderline narcissism, histrionic, this sort of thing. I can tell you that the recent, I don't know, maybe within the last five years, and it just seems to be getting worse. The obsession that people have, even other clinicians, honestly, it's Dr. Romani. Okay. Can I just say this as a, I need you guys to hold me accountable. I'm asking you to hold me accountable. I do really want to be careful with my language as well. I know I also run into the problem of calling everybody a narcissist. So I really want to be careful. I know I like to, you know, caveat, not the personality disorder, the ego thing. And I think that's really important. But if you catch me calling someone a narcissist, just be like, Brittany, Brittany, don't use the N word. <laughs> you know, I know it's going to get clipped, but you know what I mean? Like, Brittany, don't use the narc word. I just want to make sure that when I use it, I'm being, you know, like NPD, Personality. So I just want to, I want to contribute to that. I'm, I'm trying to get better with my language, obviously. So if you guys catch me doing it, just be like, you know, spank the cult leader, if you will. It's really upsetting, but all right. So sorry, uh, in, in contrast, the reason I like Dr. Kirkonda in contrast to like a Dr. Romani is Dr. Romani is like narcissists will never get better. They're like evil people. And I'm like, okay, relax. I get it. Nar like NPD people are people who feel like high narcissists. Like they can feel exhausting. Not that we ever know if our loved ones have NPD because they're not diagnosed. But yes, I know what you mean. You're dealing with a very t specific type of person where it's always there. You know, they're always the victim and they're always, you know, the one, at the one who needs the attention. I understand. But uh, Dr. Kirkonda actually not only works with people with NPD specifically, but says that they can make improvements. And I think that's really important. Like they can make improvements. And I think that that's what I want to hear from my clinicians. I want to hear people say that people can get better because I believe that. And so I just love that about Dr. Kirkonda's work in contrast to like a Dr. Romani's personally. 
what do I say briefly? This would be like if you were explaining to an alien what a car was, what an automobile was, and you said, so a car is defined as a vehicle with four wheels that has some sort of engine that gets you from point A to point B. It can transport one or more people, something like that. All right, so you're doing pretty well thus far. Then you add to the definition by saying, and in particular, it involves a red car that's painted red, and it's made by Chevrolet, and it was manufactured between the years 2015 and 2016. That's what this is like. Gaslighting can exist in a variety of different personality types, a variety of different sorts of people, including people who suffer from narcissistic personality disorder. But not everyone with narcissistic personality disorder is going to engage in gaslighting or even with abuse. The thing that has to be established is that gaslighting is within an abusive relationship. When you think gaslighting, think abusive relationship. It's just one of the tactics that abusive perpetrators will use to control the victims. It's not something that you can just do. Uh, uh, to, you can't meet someone and gaslight them in terms of the clinical definition. But... I understand that language changes and people start using words to mean other sorts of things. That's, that's really important. I think grooming is also one of those words and I have to be careful myself because grooming isn't just you meet someone and you can groom them like it, you know, and I think I didn't know this about gaslighting technically that you can't like gaslight a person. You have to build some sort of there has to be some sort of long term within a relationship kind of thing happening. So I'm going to keep that in mind too. Grooming will change the definition of grooming. Gaslighting has changed. And so I think we do need to pay attention to that. But I would personally, when I watched this video earlier by myself, I thought to myself, the reason I love his brain is like he wants things to mean things and for us to know what they mean. And I would like to know the difference. But of course, you know, I'm not a therapy channel. And so it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to say, I want to learn about these words and not get caught using them, but I would love to know the clinical difference between gaslighting and the way that pulp culture uses it. So maybe I can even do a video or a collaboration with him on that. Maybe I can ask Dr. Kirkonda, do you want to do a collab on how would, how would a normal person in their everyday life kind of have a relationship with this word that has been incorporated into pop culture that's really important means something to us, but yet it is sort of the wrong word. And so I think that's that would be a cool conversation. Mikey, a member for six months, says, I'm just finished watching the stream from yesterday and I'm so tempted to pay the $250 tier now just to fuck around. <laughs> Mikey, slow down. Thank you. You do enough. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Shout out to the cult member, Mikey. He's a level 17. So you guys better step up your game because Mikey got you beat. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. Things, but I find that there are other words that we have for those situations, like lying to someone or motivated reasoning. Or you See, know. he uses just normal people words. And I do think that we need to go back to that. And hey, maybe that's why the internet keeps seeing me as an authority figure I don't want to be. Maybe I'm using language that is so normal in girl bubbles. Guys, listen to me when I say this. This language I use is so normal in girl bubbles, but I'm wondering if when I use it on stream and a boy bubble hears it and they go, why is she using that clinician word or that clinical word? And then I wonder if they're thinking that I'm thinking that I'm trying to signal to them some sort of status when I'm literally just saying a word that's so common in like girl queer bubbles. I'm not even thinking about it that hard. You're such a gaslighter. Like that's just internet speak at this point, but I understand that in a clinical sense, that's not what I'm saying. I could never diagnose, like I can't diagnose narcissism in somebody. I'm not a clinician. I don't have a patient. So, you know, I think there's something to be said about how we all use language. So I'll work on it. I'll try to get a little bit better about knowing, you know, in the, maybe that's a problem. Like, huh? Yeah. You're just lying. Like, hey, I think you're kind of telling a fib right now or a lie or an unintentional mistruth or, hey, I think you're being a little avoidant or, hey, it's like attachment, you know, styles. Everyone reads the book Attachment and decides like they're an expert on attachment styles. Just trying to manipulate, just, just say manipulate or lying. I didn't, but let's watch. So the first one is denying something that definitely happened. So an example of this could be like you and your partner had a huge argument and maybe they called you names or said something. And then the next day when you try to confront them, they completely deny that ever happened. They try. This is perhaps an example. It's just hard to know. But on one hand, yes, if you have a partner that is calling you names and being verbally abusive, and then the next day they say you were crazy and they claim they don't remember calling you those names, might that be gaslighting? Yeah, it, that, that could be. On the other hand, 
uh, it's universal that when you are in a fight with your partner, let's say two people have a fight one night and there's no abuse happening. It's just regular conflict. Maybe it's high conflict. Universally, when- Ooh, I love this language, high conflict, low conflict, right? I like the specificity. I like the whole, like you're being toxic or what, well, how much am I being toxic or how much am I? I like the specificity of the levels, high toxic, high abuse, high argument, high conflict. Like, I like that. Uh, those two people come into my office for a couple therapy and I ask them how their week was and they say, oh, we had this fight last night. And then I say, oh, well, why don't you tell me about it? And the, each of them will have a completely different story and will be upset at the other person for making stuff up or not remembering things. That's not gaslighting. That's just typical selective memory that we all engage in. It's not a great thing. It really can be highly destructive. I'm not saying it's good, but that's not gaslighting. I say that you were crazy. You heard wrong. That's not what happened. I never said that. And then what that causes you to do is go. I also think it's pride. If you've ever gotten in a fight with a Middle Eastern man, let me tell you the way. Actually, let me rephrase. Have you ever gone into an argument with a man? They will. <laughs> Listen, I know I use these words, men, women. What are men and women? I mean, is gender a construct? Definitely. So who knows what I'm really saying? There's a type of human on the planet that usually identifies themselves as a man and thinks too highly of themselves because they're a man. They're known usually as misogynists, but okay. Other than that, they're, they're not even just the misogynist, just a regular person who has hurt feelings and their pride is hurt. They will, they will know, like they'll, you'll say like, Hey, you really hurt my feelings yesterday. And they'll be like, like this, like dismissive. They're like, I didn't say that. And it's like, okay, you're not willing to have the real conversation where you like acknowledge your fault because you're not there yet. But you know what you did and I know what you did. And we're going to pretend for a moment that it didn't happen in hopes that in the future we'll talk about it. It is very annoying. Okay. But that's not gaslighting. That's them being too embarrassed and prideful to have the real conversation, which a lot of people engage with. Like ultimately, butthurt feelings make you do butthurt people things. And men get butthurt. Women do too. But, you know, I'm on a, I'm on a, I'm in a mood today. <laughs> Oh my God, did I make this up? Is there something wrong with me? You start to discredit your own fucking reality. Generally speaking, that's that's a good definite, it's a good example. But if I were a little asterisk on her shoulder, if you will, I would say that it's within an abusive relationship. You, There would be a lot of other behaviors and experience that typified that an abusive relationship was happening. But, you know, maybe... I like the girls in chat owning up to the behavior too. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Let's call it pride. When you're in that pride moment, you're like, that didn't happen. Mm -mm. Like, you don't want to face it. Look, we all have our moments. Let's call it, what do you think? Vegeta's pride. Is that more accurate? Sounds like my grandma. Both of you said sounds like my grandma. I love that for both of the chatters. You can build a cult around your grandmas. There you go. Shout out to yesterday's stream, bro. For a lot of victims, they don't identify that way yet. That's often true. And a video like this might uh, help them to see, well, hey, I, that does happen to me. Maybe I am being gaslit. But I, I think the problem is, is that often the way this is talked about without understanding the broader topic of what an abusive relationship would look like and how it would feel like as a victim, that if you had a fight with your partner last night and it's not abusive, it's not gaslighting, and you both remember different things, very quickly I will see people say, you're gaslighting me when it's, it's now, it, it, I don't know, is it a harm that people misuse the terms in terms of what I think is the definition? There's probably not a ton of harm, but I think that one, it's important not to minimize the experience of actual victims of gaslighting by just claiming everything is gaslighting. Also, I'm, I'm very much a fan of precision in language because then we not only have to refine our concepts as we speak and communicate, but it also helps other people to understand what we're saying. And if we just dilute the term of gaslighting to mean anything, then it ruins our opportunity of not only understanding what we are trying to say, but also communicating it. And then you don't hold boundaries because now it is a dilemma though, because like, you can never get there universally, right? Like you can never get there universally, but I, I, I do think that's why it's important to know like which bubble is speaking. So if it's like clinicians and professionals, they'll use the language in a different way and mean a different thing by it. And then if we're having the conversation with laymen or non-professionals, we're having a different conversation with it. You know, I think that's important. Kay says it looks identical to me no matter who it shows up in. So gender aside, I agree. Ult well, ultimately, I do think gender doesn't play a role, but I do think it's categorization. So it exhibits its way differently because of gender. So there's a type of pride that exhibits in a person, but the why is different and then how it exhibits it's different. So somebody might actually exhibit like a, 
I didn't say that. Fuck you. Like an angry or maybe more aggressive response. And then somebody else might be like, I didn't say that. I'm sorry. I just like, I don't remember saying that. And it feels like, mm, like, you know, more like downplayed, more like, mm, like they're, you know, they're not angry. They're not yelling, but they're, mm, I don't remember that. You know, it's like very, um, and then maybe there's somebody who's more like crying or physically sad, or it's like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's, you know, the stress gets to you and then your pride builds up to like kind of protect yourself sometimes. And all of a sudden you're like, I'm not having this conversation. So there's, you know, there's, there's a lot of reasons, but I do think it exhibits differently because of how genders are trained or how genders are exhibited. And I think that's interesting. And I will say you have to have usually a very safe, safe space to feel vulnerable in the first place to say you did something wrong, because how scary is it in a world that's so punishment, punishment, punishment to say you did something wrong if the consequence is so beyond reasonable for the crime. And growing up in America, there is a huge difference, in my opinion, on how People here just like love punishment. Other countries have that problem too. But just from an American perspective, there is such a joy in watching people suffer, which to be fair is just so human in general. But you know what I mean? There's like a specific, I'll kick them, kill them, punch them, destroy them. And I'm like, whoa. You know, so it's kind of scary to be vulnerable and say in that moment, you're right, I did do something wrong. I think that's why it's so nice to be in a very healthy relationship where you genuinely feel very healthy and safe expressing that vulnerability and or maybe, and this happens in healthy relationships too, maybe you aren't ready and you have a small moment, but it's okay. It's not, we're not gonna hold it over your head for having a moment. Like even in a healthy relationship, in my opinion, let's say you have one of those days where your partner like isn't ready to talk about something, it's you're not gonna hold it over their head and punish them because of that. It's like, a two, it's, it's interesting. There's so much nuance here. And then it always goes back down to, am I dealing with somebody that's going to work on things or not? And that's what it ultimately comes down to. Am I dating or married or partnering or have friendships with somebody that's going to work on it? Or am I dealing with somebody that like it's either their way or it doesn't work? Or we're not seeing each other and speaking the same languages? Or maybe we can't get through to each other, which is why people go to counseling, by the way. So a third party can come in and help them, you know, they mediate. That's why people do counseling a lot of the time, because it really helps to have a mediator there when the both of you are, you know, having a hard time with communication. And then ultimately, maybe you just find out you're not good communicators with one another and you have to move on, you know? TMM says, how can I tell the difference between what, when someone is gaslighting me and when they're actually pointing out that I've misperceived something? You know, I think this is the struggle we're all going to have. Right. We're going to have to like look at the data and then try to understand where this person's coming from. And I do think ultimately this is why we're all so afraid is if we don't know ourselves and we don't know that person and that person doesn't know, then we're all like wondering, am I in that kind of a relationship? Do I have this kind of friendship? Is Am I being gaslit right now? And then maybe the person is just unable to have that communication style with you in the first place. So that's why I think I am optimistic about people. Because I do think a lot more people are less malicious than we think, but a lot more people are thoughtless more than we realize without the maliciousness necessarily. Alice says, is gaslighting about intent or outcome? That's a great question. That's a great question. I don't know. I think both maybe intent, maybe intent first and outcome is the hope because you can't guarantee the outcome. But the intention definitely is there. So yeah, I think you have to have the intent first from what Dr. Kirkonda said. And then the outcome is, who knows? Now that person has just made you feel like you are the crazy one. Two, trivializing your feelings or emotions. An example of that could be that your partner says something to you that hurts you and you express yourself saying, hey, that really hurt my feelings. And instead of them acknowledging and saying, hey, so sorry, didn't mean to hurt your feelings, didn't mean to say it that way. They start to say, you're too sensitive. You're overreacting. You're making a big Okay. This one's even worse. It could be gaslighting. Absolutely. If or it could just be the comment sections of a YouTube video. I were and I have treated an abusive perpetrator, the perpetrator of intimate partner violence and control. This is something that often will happen. The abusive individual will harm the victim. The victim will express their feelings and the abusive person will say you're overreacting. It's almost universal that abusive people will do that. But <laughs> This also happens outside of abusive relationships. You will find that almost everybody, and I'm telling you, as a specialist in couple therapy, 
almost everyone, even the most healthiest of couples, when they hurt the their. Wait, 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 Hannah. Hannah says, I've been on both ends and wondering if I'm being gaslit or if I'm gaslighting. I don't think you can gaslight without the intent of gaslighting. I think you're good. If you're wondering, am I gaslighting somebody? Well, you wouldn't need to wonder. You would know. That's why I say grooming, you can't do accidentally. You would have to know you're grooming somebody. So you can't accidentally groom somebody. You would have to have like, I think that's why uh, people have to understand. Well, language changes. To, I mean, I, you know, I almost want to say like words have to mean something, but words only have to mean something when they matter. Words don't have to mean anything unless they matter because they're a construct. But when they matter, it's important to have the right words to describe the right thing. That's why I only want a right diagnosis. Because if you get the wrong diagnosis, if you get the wrong thing, that's going to change things. If you get the right thing, oh, you get a lot better things. Like there's like better things. Kayla says with NPD, couldn't it be argued it's less intentional? Like they can't help but be very self-centered and it seems. I had that problem with the diagnosed vulnerable NPD. I don't know. I think... NPD doesn't take away their agency. Like lots of NPDs are very successful. I mean, there's a very famous one on TikTok, right? Like having NPD doesn't not, it, it, like and having NPD could impact, could not impact. And I think that's what Dr. Kirkon is really saying. Maybe it could, and it depends on which one you're having. I think in society, the world wants black and white answers. You know, the irony of calling me black and white thinker is the world wants me to be a black and white thinker. I would argue I am far more nuanced than everybody else because you are literally saying to me, pick one, right or wrong. And I'm saying, well, what about the gray? What if this is the circumstance? They're like, no, it's either right or wrong. And I'm like, I, I don't know how to do this. And I feel like sometimes I'm being gaslit by the world by being told I'm a black and white thinker when I'm literally saying, I don't know. Not everybody with NPD gaslights. Not everybody with NPD is abusive. Not everybody with NPD, like it just, you've met every single person with NPD. It's like we're generalizing these diagnoses in order to sort of protect ourselves, but then we're so traumatized. We don't realize we're hurting probably pretty innocent people, people who are suffering. So we have to be very careful in some ways, but I understand the generalization of wanting to be safer rather than sorry. Right? I don't think you're wrong for wanting to be safe and avoid dating an NPD. But I also think that's not, it's not reasonable to also like punish them because they have NPD. Right? Elo, welcome to the members. Your spouse's feelings, which is just going to happen over time. And the spouse, the partner says, hey, you hurt my feelings almost all the time. <laughs> It's really aggravating, uh, not only just to me personally, but also just as a clinician, it's just, it's it's so hard to get across to people that if someone expresses to you that you've hurt their feelings, even if you think that they're overly sensitive, you just don't want to start there. <laughs> you, you, you maybe get there later, maybe, but uh, up front, you just want to say, oh my God, what happened? I'm sorry, or ask questions or, or uh, you know, just stay within a more questioning stance or gathering information stance. At best, you can say, I'm so sorry that I hurt your feelings. I, I, I didn't mean to, but um, I, I take your word for it because I love you and I want you to be happy. So, and I also know that I'm not a perfect observer of reality. Uh, I have biases, we all do. So although I can't figure out why your feelings are hurt, I just have to figure I have a blind spot or I shout out to Dr. Kirk saying everybody has biases. Amen. I'm not you. I don't see things the way you do, which is fine. Everyone's different. You know, almost never do people react like that. So if this is the def, if this is a good example of gaslighting, that really anytime this happens, gaslighting is happening is what is being said. Then literally every human on the planet is gaslighting. Mm. So there's mm. that. Now, again, in an abusive relationship, does it happen? Yes, almost universally. But it also happens in every relationship. So feel out of nothing. They might say things like, you're super dramatic. Can't you take a joke? And again, it avoids taking accountability because God forbid somebody say, hey, you're right. I did hurt you. Didn't mean to. And three, shifting blame and undermining your thoughts. A great example of this is you think and you suspect that your partner is cheating on you. And when you try to talk to them and say something, instead of understanding your concerns and maybe having a conversation about it, they accuse you of being paranoid, untrusting. They say that you're insecure. All right. Again, not a great example. Could it be gaslighting? Absolutely. If you have uh, an abusive partner who is cheating, which can happen for sure, and the victim of the abuse finds out or suspects and questions the abusive partner about infidelity and says, hey, you know, some was so-and-so said that they saw you with this other person. And then the abusive cheater 
it says, oh my God, you're paranoid, you're insecure. Uh, could that be a part of a larger campaign of gaslighting that the abusive person is engaging in? Absolutely. But it could also be that the person literally is paranoid. That happens. In fact, mm -hmm. and this happens a lot too, where uh, uh, accusations of gaslighting will happen from the abusive person. So let's consider this exact mm -hmm. example, mm -hmm. but in a different relationship where you have the abusive person is, a, is accusing the victim of cheating which happens and the victim is not cheating. And the victim is like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm not cheating. If anyone, you're cheating, but I'm not cheating. You're paranoid in this person. I know you're cheating because I saw you texting someone the other day and you're thinking, maybe I was texting my mom. I, I, I think you're paranoid, okay? And then this person's like, you're gaslighting me. No, they're not. <laughs> mm. This person mm -hmm. is the abusive person. You see how he's literally trying to make sure that we actually know what's going on this is this is what I want to see, baby. I want to see us making absolutely sure we're identifying the right arguments and conversations because again, it is it's not what you're saying. It's not what you're doing. It's how and what and everything else. It's like when you have two friends and they're like, oh my God, bitch, you're so stupid, bitch. And then you have a friend who's like, you're fucking cum. And it's like, whoa. Whoa, what was that? You can have a conversation which is casual in one circumstance and then just not with the other. You can, you know, again, I, I love this. I love this video because it is exactly why I'm like, well, but what happened? And then what, but now here's the problem. Okay, did I finish any of those sentences? I really got to work on that, guys. Because we know that it's not just as easy as saying, well, if somebody does this, they're always bad. Okay, that's not what it is. It's everything within the context then what we do is we start to overcorrect. And I do this a lot because I'm terrified of accusing the wrong person of something that didn't happen because what a horrible feeling. Been there, done that. Like be, I've been accused. It's a horrible feeling, right? I don't want to do that to somebody. That's why I make corrections on my videos, right? So the dilemma is that we overcorrect and then we accidentally let predators get kind of like a slip or a leg up, or maybe we're too lenient on them because we think, well, what if the circumstance is this? And what if the circumstance is this? And this is something that I'm learning, try I'm trying really hard not to overcorrect on because we live in a world where, where I want to do it, you want to do it. We just want to accuse people of being the worst kinds of people. But I also want to make sure that if they're not the worst kinds of people and they're actually just a person who needs good therapy or some remission work, well, then wait a second, let's hold on. And so I am trying to learn not to overcorrect and allow people to get away with bad behavior just because they're just a person. But also, I don't want to accuse everyone of being a murderer when they're not, you know? And I think that's the problem. Just which one is it? And I just want to make sure we're identifying the right person with the right word. So that's why in the example that I gave earlier about you can read the definition of some biological or I can as a non biologist, I can read a definition of some biological process and still not be able to diagnose it. And this is an example of that. You need to study this. You need to look at the mm -hmm. research. You need a lot of clinical experience and people that supervise you to manage how you manage your own countertransference, your own judgment, your own assessments. But of the gaslighting TikToks that I've seen, I'll tell you, this one is is uh, a lot better than the other ones. You know, I'm guessing that this TikTok video, video does a lot of good, honestly. I, I live in a world of academia and clinicians and research and the clinical literature. And you know, looking at TikToks, it's just a sharp contrast to that. So I want to pause here and say that the rest of this video will just be for members of the YouTube channel. I'm going to start the next bit by providing the definition, just a quick definition to establish what the clinical definition is. And I've also thought about it and expanded on it a little bit, um, given my own take on the matter. But that'll be that. So if you want to watch this, become a member by clicking the join button. Or whoop, whoop, become a member for Dr. Kirkanda's channel. OK, I really, really love this video. And again, it's a good, you know, uh, opportunity for me to also slow down and make sure that I'm using, you know, I use words. <laughs> so incorrectly. And it's not on purpose. I'm not using words incorrectly on purpose. It's just, I think it's a part of how my brain operates. And so I'm learning how to like stop it from doing that. And I'm not being lazy. I'm actually just, it's a little bit of a, huh, like that word makes sense to my brain and that's how it goes. And that's why it makes sense to me. And I, I will work on it, of course, but this allows me to pause and remember that like from a clinician, clinician's experience and perspective, he's looking at the rest of us and probably like rolling. He's like, oh my God, if Dr. Kirkanda's ever watched my videos, he probably rolls his eyes 
so much at my videos because I definitely throw these words around and I obviously want to get better at it. But this is why I say there is a difference between a real therapist and a person making videos on the internet, guys. This is a therapist. This is a scientist. He is a Dr. Kirkonda. There's a doctor. Like he cares about the research. Dr. K. Like these people are doctors. They they are therapists. They are very interested are psychologists. They're very interested in their field. It is very different than some random YouTuber who's never been to college or graduated having a conversation on the internet. Yeah. Okay. I know there's always that conversation, you know, but that's not what we're doing. And I think, I do think I'm going to call it out a little bit that there are content creators that think they're just as smart as people who have gone through the schooling uh, in this particular, in psychology. And they think they are as smart as these clinicians. And I do think they try to make content sometimes pretending to be sort of like therapists that aren't therapists. Obviously, I'm not trying to do that. But I do think that that is something that I I wanted to point out, I guess, that there is really a difference between somebody who studies these things and somebody who just makes a video misusing pop culture psychology or using words incorrectly. So I'll be more careful at that, but it's, oh man, it's going to be hard since language is changing so much. I guess we'll see what happens. Okay. So great video. Great video. We love him. Great video. In my head, in real life while I'm dead, my belly's being fed and I'm okay. I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine, not to you in my mind, cause I know I Da, 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 da. 